Welcome back, everybody, to Making African America, a virtual symposium on immigration and the changing dynamics of blackness. My name is Julie Green, and I'm the director of the Center for Global Migration Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. I'm really delighted to be chairing our first session this afternoon on African American, American African encounters featuring Sia Kabona Clark, Joshua Guild, and Nancy Mirabal. I want to introduce each of our speakers uh, and then we'll turn it over to them. We'll have time for questions and discussion from um, questions from the audience and discussion with our featured speakers. Sia Kabona Clark is Associate Professor of African Studies at Howard University. She's written on African migrant experiences and African Black identity, including her co-edited volume, Pan-African Spaces, Essays on Black Transnationalism, and her article, quote, Identity Among First and Second Generation African Immigrants in the United States. Professor Clark has also written two books on hip hop in Africa. Joshua Guild is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at Princeton University. His upcoming book, In the Shadows of the Metropolis, Cultural Politics and Black Communities in Post-War New York and London, examines Afro-Caribbean migration and community formation from the 1930s to the 1970s. Professor Guild's research interests include the making of the modern African diaspora, Black internationalism, and the Black radical tradition. Finally, Nancy Mirabal is Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. Her most recent monograph is Suspect Freedoms, the Racial and Sexual Politics of Cubanidad in New York, 1823 to 1957. Professor Mirabal's research interests include Afro-diasporic studies, immigration, and archive and knowledge production. Thank you all three so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments. On to Professor Clark. Okay. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so a lot of my work has focused on hip hop artists, um, specifically looking at African hip hop artists in the US, but I've also done a lot of work on immigration, black identity and kind of what that means. So I, I wanna, talk a bit about some of the research I've been doing recently. And that's really been looking at the role that African immigrant artists play in, in kind of what it means to be black in America, um, but also the role that they play in the interactions between African and diaspora communities. And I think that when we look at where hip hop started in the 1970s in the South Bronx and predominantly working class communities, Latino and black communities, and then kind of made its way to the continent. And as African artists were coming to the US, they brought their music with them. Uh, but then you also had those who were the children of African immigrants who were here previously. So we know from, you know, the data that the 1980s is really the decade that we saw significant increases in migration from Africa to the United States. And the diaspora, the African diaspora community in America grew significantly as a result. And so we've seen more recently as well, increased migration from the diaspora to the continent. So whether that be African-Americans or West Indians moving to Africa or Africans coming here for school and then you know, perhaps moving back for employment opportunities. But we've also seen social and digital media really kind of bringing groups together in important ways. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm focusing on the African presence in the US rather than looking at what's happening 
on the continent, which I think is also a really interesting dynamic to see how African, African Americans moving to the continent are impacting and having changes locally in cities like uh, in Accra, Nairobi, Johannesburg, Cape Town. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interesting things happen there. But looking at the US, um, we've also seen an increase in African music on mainstream platforms in America. So, you know, you've had, you know, kind of community radio shows, independent radio, where you could hear African music from time to time. But we're seeing that music have a place or finding space within mainstream platforms. And so we're also seeing collaborations between African artists of first or second generation African ancestry with African artists of multi-generational African ancestry. So when you think of those who immigrated here again from the continent or who were the children of migrants collaborating with African Americans who have kind of multiple generations in this country. So in all cases, artists are increasingly nuanced in their coverage of topics of immediate concern to other African and diaspora communities. So you will see uh, more African-American artists, for example, more recently talking about the NSARS movement or involved in that discussion or weighing in on that discussion. And you've also had a lot of African artists discussing or commentating on things that are happening in the US around race, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and so forth. So hip hop structure as a genre, um, it's largely autobiographical. And so it lends itself to being a conduit for important conversations around race, gender, sexuality and politics. And so I wanna look at two main groups um, that have and are influencing African and diaspora connections. So these are artists of the first generation migrants that were coming here. These are first generation migrants that were coming here in the early 2000s for school. And then the second group were artists that are 1.5 or second generation migrants who were born to migrants from Africa to the US that came in the 1970s and the 1980s. So those are two distinct groups. And so for that first group, as the ones who did the migrating, we first saw the articulation of African-American and African connections among African hip hop artists coming to the US. So when we talk about, you know, people, artists talking about or dealing with the connections between the diaspora and the continent, again, we see that really happening with those who were arriving here in the early 2000s. And not by accident, uh, most of these artists were Ghanaian. So, when you look at the African artists that came here in the early 2000s, you had artists like Blitz the Ambassador, Mensa, uh, Minister of Agriculture, Manifest, One Love the Kubalor, all Ghanaian artists, all who came to the United States in the early 2000s, and all who were articulating some um, views on Pan-Africanism. And so, you know, it, not again, not an accident. They, they arrived from a country whose place in Af Pan-African history is well established. So you've got, for example, Bliss the Ambassador doing songs that speak to the African presence in America. So he has a song called Africans in New York. Um, I'm going to attempt to do a, a couple renditions or, or try to uh, cite some of their lyrics or recite. So bear with me. But in his song, Africans in New York, he says, um, we're taking it back to the real, 001 till infinity, original immigrant, never facsimile, from Flatbush to Marcy, Bushwick, Canarsie, my Africans are running things, catch us on Canal Street, selling fake Gucci, fake Prada, fake Louis V, some of us got bathroom degrees, between me, between you and me, we still push the dollar cap, wherever the dollar's at, we wire that. Western Union money gram without a doubt, speaking with our native tongues, and I ain't talking about tribe in them. I'm talking tree, Swahili, Wolof, you're not understanding them. Dance Africa, where we parading at BAM. The flyest African women be looking like, damn. Some are Eritrean and some are from Sudan. Some came here to model and some came here to dance. Whatever the hustle, baby, keep them dream, keep that dream alive. New York City, Africans, we hustle to survive. So with just within that, he encapsulates the African experience in, in New York City. I mean, I think those of us who've been to New York have uh, have seen some of the African men uh, selling fake Gucci and Prada, um, Canal Street in Harlem, uh, in various areas. And we also know the dollar cab, 
um, a lot of the taxi drivers, you know, are, are coming from the continent as well and the whole struggle of sending money home. But he also has a song called Ghetto Plantation, where he says, incarceration is a new plantation, a new kind of slavery, a new foundation. And it wouldn't even cost you much. The project is a slave ship. The corner is an auction block. Police officers enlisting the overseers were victims of a crooked system that's meant to defeat us. So in one song, he, he's talking about a very specific African immigrant experience. In another, he's talking about really the essence of the movement for black lives and, and kind of the prison industrial complex and, and looking at what that does to black bodies, black and brown bodies. That is something that is distinctly American. And that is something that to have that level of insight takes a level of identification with that community. Because he's not saying those people over there are having to deal with this or in this in this system. He is placing himself as amongst those individuals. So he's creating a clear connection between himself, a Ghanaian, as well as African Americans um, in the communities that, that he's in. So he looks at and you know, this is again for Bliss Ambassador. Um, he's always kind of had this, this, this theme. These themes in his music where he talks about the African experience as well as the African American experience, but does so from a Pan African perspective. Then you have other artists like Manifest, who many of his songs have also referred to or use symbolism that is distinctly found in African American community. Like he has one song where he's you know telling um, a rival to you know, basically leave him alone. And he has the line, keep it stepping like a kappa. So just that line in itself may seem rather small, but within that line, only someone who has a familiarity with the African-American community and African-American culture understands that phrase, keep it stepping like a kappa, in reference to the black fraternity Kappa Alpha Psi, which is known for um, stepping. Uh, so there are these references that you find and this um, acknowledgement of this connection between the diaspora um, and the continent. One Love and Mensa, they, you know, they've got a song called Thank You, where they talk about uh, corruption and, you know, uh, racism. But within that song, they thank many African and African-American leaders and Caribbean leaders. So they have a line in there where they're thanking people like Kwame Nkrumah and Yaa Santewa. But they also thank Frederick Douglass and Nat Turner and Sojourner Truth and Langston Hughes and Sheikh Anta Job, Thomas Sankara, Fred Hampton, Holly Selassie, and, and numerous others. Again, placing themselves as part of this diaspora and connecting these areas of the diaspora as well as the continent. And then we've got other artists like Kanan from Somalia, Dumi Wright from Zimbabwe, Crooked, otherwise known as Ryonga from uh, Uganda, and Shad from Kenya, who also speak to those connections. And they would do so in ways that would usher in, so we're talking again, early 2000s, um, but they would do so in a way that would usher in the beginning of a contemporary so-called Africanization of Black popular music in America. And by Africanization, what I mean is the emergence of um, African beats and rhythms and contemporary Black music on the, again, mainstream show radios. So you've got artists like DeVito and Burna Boy, Shata Wale and others. These are not hip hop artists. These are Afro beats artists or pop musicians. But again, you've got these early artists coming here in the 2000s really helping to pave the way for those that would come later um, and really benefit from the work that was done by some of these earlier artists. And so these artists have brought their African beats and blended them with African-American aesthetics to create new collaborations, new styles. Of course, we've seen some um, in the, you know, the Black is King project by Beyonce is probably one of the biggest budget productions where we see these, these collaborations and the blending of these styles, these sounds, these aesthetics. Um, but you have others. So Shad from Kenya hosts the show Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix. And so here's a, a Kenyan artist based in, in Canada who is doing this show but it's really tracing the history of hip hop culture in America. And he's interviewing all of these really pioneering artists in specifically in New York City, he goes to Los Angeles, he's in Atlanta, 
Um, and then you've got Revolt TV, which is the network. I don't remember when it was established, but it was the network um, by Puff Daddy. Um, it was created by Puff Daddy. And so he had shows on there, like Internationally Known, but also What's Good Africa, which is a show that looks at hip hop culture in Africa, though they primarily are just in Kenya, but the show is hip hop Africa. So looking quickly at the second generation artists that represent kind of the emerging characteristics of black identity in America, you've got artists like um, the, the uh, recently deceased Nipsey Hussle, who was born in the 80s in Los Angeles, but to a mother who was African-American and a father who was Eritrean. Now you have someone in this case who was part of the large Eritrean community of LA, um, but he was also a member of the Rolling Sixties Crips, which two very, again, one institution, if you will, that is firmly kind of emerges out of um, South Central Los Angeles uh, cultures and communities. Um, you've got people like Amin, who grew up in Portland. He's born in 1994 to Eritrean and Ethiopian parents. Um, you've got people like Tabby Benet, um, who was technically was born in Lome in Togo, but came to the States at a really young age. Mother's African American, father's Togolese, went to Florida A&M University, a historically black college. Um, you got people like Earl Sweatshirt, who was born in 94 in Chicago. African-American mother, South African father. And so the point is that these second generation artists are also kind of representing a black identity that is diverse. So there's no, there's never been a monolithic black identity, um, but they are even representing kind of, um, representing a multi-generational African presence um, in America. And it really is, there are some interesting things that I'm, I'm seeing. So these artists and their collaborations are creating an environment in which expressions of the diversity of in black American identities are increasingly common. So it's not some far out thing that someone has, because I remember in the eighties and nineties to have an African artist on your project was like a huge thing. Cause you know, you very rarely heard African voices. Now it's, it's common, it's mainstream. It is it's not a big deal. Um, so I have really been interested in seeing kind of the trajectory of kind of the African immigrant presence in hip hop in the United States and kind of seeing where it's gone. Um, and so that is, uh, I want to in there <laughs> and try not to cover my time, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Professor Green. Thank you, uh, Kate, and the rest of the organizers for the invitation. I want to thank all the staff, uh, both at Maryland and at the Smithsonian, whose labors have made this gathering, virtual gathering, possible. It's a, it's a real honor and delight to be a part of this. Today, I want to share a few ideas from my forthcoming book, In the Shadows of the Metropolis, Cultural Politics and Black Communities in post war New York, London. The book examines uh, sort of parallel and overlapping migrations of both Black Americans from the U.S. South to New York City and uh, Afro-Caribbean immigrants uh, to both New York and London in the mid 20th century. And the neighborhoods of Central Brooklyn and West London are the really serve as the kind of focal points and the kind of grounding for my explorations. In my work, I'm interested in thinking about diaspora and diasporic relations of Blackness as both sites of radical and utopian possibility, but also as the source of real tension, fracture, disidentification uh, a bit among and between peoples who, at least on the surface, are uh, you know, sort of similarly positioned uh, in racially stratified societies. And I explore these dynamics in a range of arenas from uh, organizing around uh, anti-Black violence to institution building to electoral politics, but it's actually music and sort of the spaces of musical performance that are really kind of consistent through lines in the work. And so in the time that I have, I want to offer a few brief snapshots from what I will call in the spirit of the late uh, political and cultural theorist Richard Eiten, uh, Brooklyn's Black Fantastic. And here I'm thinking, uh, you know, after Eiten, about the realm of popular culture and about music specifically as a kind of critical site for the making of African America, following also off, off of Professor Clark. Uh, 
Eiten writes that, quote, the black fantastic is meant to refer to the minor key sensibilities generated from the experiences of the underground, the vagabond, and those constituencies marked as deviant. In this case, I want to draw attention to the conjunctions of uh, African Americans and West Indian migrants who meet both literally and figuratively on the streets of Brooklyn neighborhoods like Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights, carrying with them their own sounds, their own ways of being heard, uh, be, ways of being felt in a world uh, not necessarily disposed to hearing them in any meaningful way. Um, you know, when black musics of various kinds get taken up uh, commercially and marketed and circulated globally at particular historical moments, uh, the, the, the dynamism and the contingency embedded in their initial creation is often lost. And I think also sometimes obscured are the possibilities that are imagined by creators and that are experienced by audiences in, the moment, uh, in a moment that might suggest uh, a basis for finding common cause across divides of nation or ethnicity. I think conversely, the dissipation of time can also render less visible the differences of experience, right? The frictions within blackness produced from distinct geographies and distinct sensibilities. So considering the performance and the production, the circulation, the consumption of, of jazz, of calypso, of funk, of reggae, of, of even early hip hop in New York, uh, I wanna suggest requires attending to these kind of um, intersecting routes of migration by which blackness's multiplicity is both theorized, but is also lived. But I remain committed to, to doing that, trying to do that work um, in the context of specific neighborhoods. I'm interested in tracing, as Richard I says, quote, the ways the local can function as a site of diaspora rediffusion. It's about uh, more than a decade ago, I came across this passage in an article called Diasporic Sounds by a British sociologist named Vic Seidler. Um, and this passage has just sort of like arrested me and, and, and sort of and stuck with me. And I've, and I've really been kind of mulling it over and thinking about its implications for a long time. I'll just read it here. Seidler writes, where do songs, where do sounds belong? Do they have, they have a particular place of origin or can they cross boundaries with ease? Can people take their sounds with them as they migrate from one culture to another? Do these sounds serve to remind people where they have come from as if they have never left? Or do, or do these sounds express a yearning for what has been left behind so that they sometimes become difficult to hear again? I've taken Seedler's invitation to sort of reflect on the geographies of sound, and in my case, black sound, and to consider the soundtracks of urban black migration and movement. And, and here I wanna, I wanna be sort of attentive to uh, the, the caution um, that, I've, that I've, I've come across recently from the musicologist Matthew D. Morrison to, uh, to really distinguish between sound and music. So I don't wanna necessarily conflate the two, but for my purposes here, uh, I'll just sort of insert music. Um, and, and to try to think about black music uh, along with Seedler and uh, Nadia Ellis and so many others, to think about music as a place where we can think about loss and dislocation in the black diaspora. How do we hear that loss? How does it manifest? But I wanna actually first begin with a couple instances of what I'm thinking as, as possibility. And I wanna take us back to, to the Brooklyn of the 1930s. Um, and just to, to kind of give you a sense, and there, there are the, the, the archive of Black Brooklyn as many other sites that we could choose are, are, are really replete with these kinds of examples uh, of, of, of African America being made in time, right? Uh, and so I'll take, for example, the uh, poet and writer June Jordan, whose memories of her block growing up on Hancock Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where her family lived, reveal some of the diversity. Jordan's family was Jamaican, um, but her aunt was married to an African-American uh, World War II veteran, World War I veteran, rather. And the couple lived in an apartment on a top floor of Jordan's, uh, the Jordan family's brownstone. And so this is how June Jordan describes her block. She said, we had rice and peas and curried lamb or upstairs in my aunt and uncle's apartment, pig's feet and greens. On the piano in the parlor, there was boogie woogie, blues and Chopin. Across the street, there were cold water flats. There were American Negroes and West Indians. Some rented their housing and some were buying their homes. There were Baptists, Holy Rollers, Episcopalian, Episcopalians side by side. 
right, the sense of, of, of these two communities, uh, and really two communities even being reductive, but African Americans and West Indians, uh, living side by side, sometimes occupying the same building. Randy Weston, the, uh, the great jazz pianist and composer, uh, experienced you know something quite similar in, in, in the neighborhood as well, within his, and even within his own family. His father was a Jamaican immigrant, uh, descended from Jamaican Maroons, who uh, made his way, was raised in uh, the Panama Canal Zone and made his way to New York uh, by way of Cuba uh, in 1924, of course, the same year that Congress passes the Johnson-Reed Act and makes his way to Brooklyn, and there he marries uh, uh, Weston's mother, Vivian Moore, who was an African-American woman who had migrated uh, from, from rural Virginia, and, and Randy Weston, of course, is their, is their offspring. And Weston's father was a, a devoted uh, Garveyite, a father of Marcus Garvey, and um, really sort of contrary to the kind of conventions of the day, instilled in uh, Randy Weston a sense of his Africanness. Right, the household had books on on African history from Leo Hansberry and and, and J. A. Rogers and others, and the musical influences that Randy Weston um, encountered and experienced were were similarly wide ranging. At her, at home, he, in his in memoir, he talks about uh, hearing popular music from uh, Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Billie Holiday, but also gospel and Cuban music. Quote. I was blessed with a combination of the black church, the blues, and calypso from our Caribbean side, plus hanging out at the Palladium and hearing music from our Afro-Caribbean side. He saw, he saw no contradiction or even conflict between these intersecting uh, cultural traditions, were as much a part of his family as they were a part of the kind of broader social world um, that, he, that he grew up in. He says, I was the first generation of New Yorkers, meaning sort of, of, of black New York migrants, right? Uh, I was the first generation of New Yorkers and I had the opportunity to savor and enjoy my mother's cooking and my father's cooking, different types of music. There were differences of accent, but I, keep, I kept seeing the relationship between the two. They were, tr and they were truly African people just from different parts of the planet. So I think in that recollection and in, in uh, the, the passage from June Jordan, you hear a kind of utopianism, right? A sort of sense of, of, of difference being uh, not something that has to be overcome, but something that's sort of natural and complementary. Of course, that's not always the case, but, but often in terms of thinking about music uh, in this space, uh, you do hear that kind of sentiment repeated uh, from the 19, uh, for folks who grew up in the 1930s and 40s and, and carrying forward at least until uh, the mid 60s or, or a little bit beyond. Another really important place of encounter and really, really important musical space in, in terms of Brooklyn's Black Fantastic was a West Indian Carnival, uh, which began in New York City on the streets of New York City uh, in Harlem in the late 1940s. Uh, it supplements and eventually comes to supersede the kind of indoor uh, Trinidadian uh, carnival celebrations and fets uh, that, that had been organized since the 1920s. It grows over the course of the late 40s and 50s. Um, and in many ways, its growth is built on a foundation um, set by uh, Calypso music. And Calypso performers had been performing and, and gaining popularity in New York uh, from the 30s uh, and continuing into the, into the late 40s. Um, Calypso is played in downtown um, uh, jazz and, and, and spoken word, what we now call spoken word kinds of venues, folk music venues, but also, of course, uptown in, in clubs and, and, and other places. And one of the figures that I want to just uh, highlight uh, is the piano player and Calypso band leader Daphne Weeks, who is one of the musicians who helps to provide the soundtrack for, for Carnival over the course of the 50s and 60s. Um, she was a Trinidadian immigrant uh, who had come in, in uh, 1946 from a, a suburb of Port of Spain, lived with her aunt on Gates Avenue in Brooklyn. She supported herself as a seamstress, but she had these musical dreams. She wanted to play music and lead her own, ba lead her own band, which is something that she had done back in Trinidad. Initially, she didn't find New York to her liking. She returns back to Trinidad, but, but then will come, come for good uh, in, in, the, in 1948, I believe. And she talks about, she, she, she kind of reminisced about the kind of beautiful West Indian dances and parties that her aunt, who she lived with, uh, took her to in those early, early years. She said Harlem was jumping. But again, as much as she enjoyed attending these parties, she really wanted to be a part of it in terms of, in terms of performance. And again, uh, so she looked, to, looked for opportunities to, to be on the bandstand, not just be part of the crowd. She says, music is there for me. I want to I play it in my blood. Um, 
And she meets Gerald Clark, who at that point was the leading Caribbean band leader in the city and was also a native of uh, Port of Spain. And uh, he's very encouraging of her ambitions and, uh, you know, but unfortunately in his band, they didn't need a penis, already had one. And that was sort of the case in many other, other bands at the time. So one Sunday afternoon, uh, Daphne Weeks uh, is up in Harlem from Brooklyn. Um, and at least, and she, she runs into, so to speak, has a ch chance to meet uh, Duke Ellington. Uh, and, and talks him up a little bit, and he encourages her to form her own band, uh, which is the same advice that Gerald Clark had given her. So eventually she does, she puts together a, a six-piece combo, uh, and over time that would expand to a full 14 members, and they performed under the name Daft Weeks and her versatile Caribbean orchestra, and they appeared all across New York, uh, but particularly in Harlem venues like the Renaissance Ballroom, the Rockland Ballroom, and so forth. And Daphne Weeks built her reputation on Calypso, she would be billed as the queen of Calypso, um, and her band was often advertised as the Calypso Orchestra. But in fact, her musical range extended beyond that one form, uh, because in, in New York, as in, again in other places, cross-pollination, musical cross-pollination, cultural cross-pollination was given. She says, oh, in those days, they were playing Calypso's Wild, and they were playing jazz, beautiful jazz, and copying from all the different jazzes, you know? Jumping at the Woodside, referring to a Count Basie tune from the Depression. So calypso and jazz, but also what she, what she would describe later as, as Spanish music, right? A nod to sort of the Afro-Latin styles that link New York in those years to a, a circuit of black performance and creative exchange that includes a port of Spain and New Orleans and Havana, Kingston and Panama. And talking about these years, she, she had a kind of a sense of pride, right? That, uh, that although gender may have colored the reception that she received, uh, that she could outplay any any pianist, any other band leader in the city. So again, it's this, this sense of possibility. Uh, now, I wanna sort of shift a little bit, shift forward in time as, I, as we move to a conclusion to sort of think about uh, as West Indian, the West Indian Parade uh, continues to expand, uh, it eventually will move from Harlem to, uh, to central Brooklyn, um, to Eastern Parkway, becomes known as the West Indian Day Parade. Um, in the mid 1960s and will kind of really grow in the 1970s. And this, this move to Berlin uh, coincides, of course, with the uh, 1965 Immigration Act, uh, which you know, brings in a new wave of Caribbean immigrants to New York City. And the move, the, the kind of move and growth of West Indian Carnival um, will also mean that new musics will have to become incorporated. It's no, lo it's no longer, if it ever was, a Trinidadian event. This is a, a, a pan West Indian or Afro-Caribbean event. And as Jamaicans in particular become the largest uh, black immigrant group in New York City, um, there's a kind of a, 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 class of, a clash of cultures, right? Between musical cultures, between Trinidadian steel pan and Calypso and the kind of ascendant Jamaican sound system culture uh, of the 1970s. And here this, this I think this speaks then the kind of tensions, right? Uh, that we can find in the musics of the diaspora or consider the recollections of the African-American writer and cultural critic, uh, another Brooklyn native, Nelson George, describing uh, that, that moment. He was going to high school in the 1970s. He says, in the tribal background that was 1970s New York, the Caribbean influx added a new twist to our eternal jockeying for space and respect. I remember when their music began to infiltrate the city. First, it was Calypso, which I'd been hearing from various house parties since I was small, but, but then, uh, 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 this new wave of immigrants didn't just combine their sound to the intimacy of private parties or clubs, using massive ba bass speakers that rattled the ice and paper cups and windows of nearby homes, a new booming molecule altering sound filled Brooklyn nights. Often it was accompanied by the unintelligible dog roll of you Roy and I Roy and other touching MCs. Though all this music would fall under the banner of what I would come to know as reggae, it was the heavy dub sound that first announced to Brooklyn that the Jamaicans had arrived and were not going to be quiet about their presence. And so as we sort of think about uh, the different ways that, that music uh, sort of both marks arrivals but also marks these encounters, we can think both in terms of possibility and tension and we can sort of mine this uh, in, in the just the final statement I wanna say is sort of think about diaspora um, as, as a place of, of, of this kind of great possibility Right, I, I turn to the to the cultural theorist uh, Catherine McKittrick, wonderful geographer, uh, 
She, she writes, diaspora geography is not the act of making maps, rather it is the act of sharing ideas about where liberation is and might be. In this way, diaspora is not a legible geography or a geographic process per se, but the practice of recognizing black life and livingness. And so what I, what I try to do with this work is to try to think about black life and livingness through music. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is, these are all exciting talks. And now we turn to Professor Mirval. Um, so thank you, uh, Julie, and thank you to everyone. Um, I also wanna thank the organizers of this important conference for inviting me to participate and be involved in such a historic and momentous collaboration and gathering. And I'm truly honored to be here, so thank you. And for this talk, I will briefly sketch the early history of Afro-diasporic mobility and the politics in the United States, uh, taking into consideration what I know best, which is the Afro-Cuban migrations north. Questions of blackness, migration, and diaspora have taken serious and exciting turns. Multiple fields are interrogating the connections and the ways we think and write about African peoples in the Americas. Rethinking questions and concepts of freedom, revolution, power, migration, intellectual production, and authorship. At the center is the radical and unthinkable notion of black mobility. The concept that historically African descended peoples have always migrated, moved, created communities, made art, articulated, written, and disseminated powerful ideas. Radical because at its core, it challenges our historical thinking concerning migration to the United States, one that rarely, if ever, includes African descended populations. There appears to be no place for the mobility of Black bodies through space and time. To chronicle the history of Black movement in places that traditionally have been defined and used to erase such movements. United States history for me is fascinating because of all that does not get told. It is in those crevices of silence and unwillingness to name experience and recognize lives that we see the futility of expired narratives that benefit so few. By historically contextualizing such migrations, we denote the making of artificial borders that refuse geographic and locative connections, the uneven processes of hemispheric freedoms, the realities of widespread revolutions and escapes. The uneasy alliances and the specter of black fear and the ever present hope of future possibilities. At the same time, it challenges the persistent myth of a traditional US historical narrative that emphasizes East to West, the colonial settler definitions of land and property, migrations from primarily Europe, and a sense of territoriality that erases the indigenous and African descended migrations and movements from Mexico, the Caribbean, Central, and South America. The majority of Africans forced to leave their homes and come to the Americas arrived not in the United States, but to the Caribbean, Central, and South America. It is estimated from 1500s to 1860, over 11 million Africans arrived to the Americas. Of that number, less than 500,000 arrived to the United States. The archive is replete with documentations of black mobility. And here I'm talking about very early. Uh, as early as 1520s, Africans had settled parts of North America, Florida, the Carolinas, and Mexico. They traveled with the Spanish, moved throughout the Southwest to present day California, where by 1790s, African descended Spanish Californianos were in the majority. The last governor of Alta California under Mexican rule in 1845, Don Bio de Jesus Pico was of African and indigenous descent. We know that during the mid to late 1700s and early 1800s, Africans migrated from Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica to Mobile, New Orleans, and Pensacola, in between colonial spaces that afforded uneven freedoms and mobility. Even in the midst of the Atlantic slave trade and the institutions of brutal slave systems throughout the hemisphere, Africans and African descended populations moved, as did their music food, religion, medicine, memories, and strategies for survival. Ideas moved, fomenting revolutions and promises of freedom. As Julius Scott so beautifully reminds us in his book, The Common Wind, Afro-American Currents in the Age of the Haitian Revolution, 
the Haitian Revolution unleashed rumors of revolt among a masterless class of runaway slaves, free people of color, deserters, smugglers, pirates, and female merchants, to name a few, who were involved in multiple and widespread black circuits of mobility, ripe with information that revolution and freedom were indeed possible within and among the Americas. The Haitian Revolution loomed large. At the same time that it inspired openings, it was also an ever constant specter of constructed and reconfigured fears of blackness that unleashed and justified violence and cruel punishment throughout the Americas, including the United States. Its influence in the United States was greater and more powerful than previously believed or documented. During the early 19th century, U.S. supporters of slavery sought to expand slavery to Cuba through several policies, including the Austin Manifesto of 1854. Implicit in their justifications of expansion and collaboration with slaveholders in Cuba was the fear that Cuba would soon become another Haiti. So common was this idea that Spanish language newspapers published in New York, such as La Verdad, uh, during the 1830s and the 1840s, argued against emancipation in Cuba and supported the annexation of Cuba to the United States. The annexation would be one more hemispheric tool to thwart abolition and the possibility of Cuba becoming another Haiti. Frederick Douglass noted as much when he wrote that the efforts to quote, acquire Cuba by purchase or force was done to prevent emancipation in that island, end quote. The politics of the hemisphere were on the minds of African-American journalists, leaders, and organizers who consistently reported on what was taking place in Cuba, Brazil, and other countries in Latin America. Early newspapers, such as the Colored American, the Anti-Slavery Examiner, and these are all published in the 1830s and the 1840s, the Freedom's Journal and the Freedman's Advocate, to name a few, were all part of the early 19th century Black press that reported consistently on the efforts of the U.S. territorial policies in the hemisphere and challenged them. They also consistently reported on the different wars of independence in Cuba, primarily the Ten Years' War, and on the Afro-Cuban general Antonio Marcel. In 1872, African-American men in New York furthered their commitment to hemispheric politics by organizing the Cuban Anti-Slavery Society, led by abolitionists Samuel Scotteron and Henry Highland Garnett. The Cuban Anti-Slavery Society called for the end of slavery in Cuba and the enfranchisement of Afro-Cubans. The Cuban Anti-Slavery Society was indicative of a larger hemispheric, larger diasporic politics based on mutuality and a shared struggle for civil rights, equality, and Pan-Africanism. As Sodron wrote in a report detailing the proceedings of the first meeting of the Anti-Slavery Society held at Cooper Institute in New York, quote, we are driven to the irresistible conclusion that the interests of humanity are inseparably connected with the cause of the Cuban patriots. It was under these conditions that a sizable Afro-Cuban community migrated to New York, Florida, and New Orleans. Afro-Cubans would later migrate to Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. Afro-Cubans who moved to New York did so for two fundamental reasons, to work in the cigar factories displaced by the revolutionary wars in Cuba and to fight for Cuban independence from Spain. For Afro-Cuban migrants, both women and men, New York was a diasporic space shaped by temporalities and promises of return, a return to Cuba of their own making, one that conjured independence, racial equality, labor rights, and a nation-building project that centered them. Black Cubans and Puerto Ricans organized hundreds of revolutionary clubs in New York, wrote for and published Spanish language newspapers, circulated ideas, and were authors of not only their own experience, but of a future in waiting. Although rarely given credit, it was Afro-Cuban revolutionaries organizing exile that led the way to establishing and articulating diasporic freedoms, post-revolutionary enfranchisement, and nationalist belonging. By the end of the Ten Years' War, New York-based Afro-Cuban revolutionaries, including Rafael Serra and Martin Moro Delgado, moved throughout the Americas, building anti-slavery movements. In 1873, the New York Times reported on large numbers of the Cuban exile societies within the Americas, quoting, citing the branches in Jamaica and South America. By the 1880s, there were numerous Cuban revolutionary clubs in Jamaica, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Panama, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Costa Rica. In 1892, there were five revolutionary clubs in Haiti alone, including El Club Hija de Martí and El Club Guarionex y Atue, which were named after two Taino leaders. The period of the Ten Years' War, 1878, and before the Cuban War for Independence in 1895, 
was a prolific period for Afro-Cuban diasporic activism. The final anti-Cuban slavery in 1886, along with the rise of the 19th century labor movement in New York, created a powerful space for Afro-Cubans to organize around Cuba's independence from Spain, labor equality, and franchisement. Implicit in such organizing was mobility and movement. This period witnessed a large increase in migrations from Cuba, Puerto Rico, the West Indies, and other parts of the Caribbean. After the United States intervened in the Cuban War for Independence, many of the Afro-Cuban revolutionaries in New York moved back to Cuba with varying success. This was not a Cuba of their own making, and the ongoing struggles would lead to multiple migrations north for most, uh, for most of the early part of the 20th century. Most notably, the period after the passage of the Platt Amendment to the Cuban Constitution, when Cuba was now under U.S. control, and in the 1930s during the presidency of Gerardo Machado. Both migrations included a sizable number of Afro-Cuban men and women who moved to Harlem and parts of growing Puerto Rican, West Indian, and Caribbean communities of the early 20th century. And I argue oftentimes we don't uh, really research or understand that the Cuban migration is not a post-59 phenomena, but it's one that really shaped early 19th century um, and even 20th centuries. And, um, and we know, for instance, in the 40s and the 50s, we see the rise of Afro-Cuban music um, and becoming an important part with African-American music as well, with the Q-Box theme and uh, with Machito and so forth, and Mario Bauza. So in conclusion, together, organizing cultural and political clubs and forming labor unions and creating a community around diasporic possibilities and futures. And I'll also add, um, by the end, that uh, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, West Indians, African Americans were also involved in organizing political clubs that were um, part of, uh, they went to fight in the Spanish Civil War, published newspapers, organized globally on Dena Mella. So there were really, in, in New York and later on we've seen other places, a really powerful diasporic community in the movement. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mirabal. All right, so we, um, the organizers have set this up so that there is plenty of time for discussion. And I see a ton of interesting questions have come in already. Um, so let me just take a second to gather my thoughts here. Um, I'd like to start with a question um, for Professor Clark. Just one second. So many questions. Um, Professor Clark, I was struck by this as well, the ways in which you described um, hip hop as biographical. And so this, this audience member asks, how can we untangle the ways that hip hop is local, national, and international? Uh, the lyrics you describe referred to specific cities and nations as well as Pan-African experiences. Do the identities that artists embody change over time and place? Do they take one certain identity in front of different audiences? Thank you for that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I in, in short, yes, artists do take on different identities in front of certain audiences. I think that artists will, if they're performing, you know, in front of an audience that's primarily people from, you know, their country of origin, they tend to localize it more. I mean, I think it's a common thing that a lot of artists will do when they're performing, um, adjust their performance based on who they're performing in front of. But I will say that in the early 2000s, it was still not quote unquote cool to be African. And you, the popularization we're seeing of African culture, African print clothing and, and African music, I do think for those who grew up in this country and you know, I'm definitely am one of them, it was definitely not cool to be African. So I think that there was a lot less expression of African identity 
especially among artists who grew up in the United States. And so you don't really see that as much until later. Um, so I think that, you know, kind of especially post Black Panther, I mean, post Black Panther and post, post Black Panther environment, I think it's um, become very cool to be African. I mean, and then especially again with the with the presence of a lot of artists and, and collaborations with mainstream artists or between mainstream African-American artists and artists from the continent. And so you see more artists now kind of claiming that identity, whereas perhaps before they want, so Wale is an example of an artist who, grew, who was born in, in the U.S., and most of his mainstream music did not contain references to being Nigerian, but a lot of his mixtape music that wasn't done through the label, um, you'll find more references to being Nigerian. So yeah, I definitely think there's a there's a change that that artists have depending on who they're performing in front of or performing for. And uh, sort of a follow up question. This comes from Caitlin Kennedy in the audience. <clears throat> are there uh, your your talk focused on male performers? Are there popular African female hip hop artists? There are not as many. So in my research, I found that more of the African women hip hop artists are in Europe and Australia. There are fewer that are here in the United States. There are a couple that are here. So like, for example, Do example, Doja Cat is a second generation artist. Her father is South African, but she was born here. Uh, she was raised without uh, really kind of a relationship with her father. Her father was actually one of the stars of the movie Sankofa with, uh, um, not Sankofa, sorry, Serafina with Whoopi Goldberg. So it's kind of been a more uh, high profile relationship because he's an actor in his own right. So you have, you know, she's there, but she doesn't have this relationship with her father. So her music often doesn't really reflect her South African roots. Um, so most of the women that I, I looked at were outside of the U.S. There are some artists like Sampa the Great, who is a Zambian artist who went to school in the United States. She also did some schooling in Australia, and now she's back in Southern Africa. She's in Botswana now. She has done collaborations with U.S. artists, and her music is very, very Pan-African. She's got you know, she's done collaborations with artists from other parts of Africa, as well as the diaspora. Um, so you do see some of that, but there aren't as many in the U.S. Uh, as there are in other regions, like in the, in Europe and Australia. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that's so exciting about all three of these papers is the, the intersections between them and the connections to uh, Professor Davies' keynote address just now in terms of migration, mobility, diaspora. Um, so here are two different questions from the audience for Professor Guild, but they really um, intersect in interesting ways. Uh, one person asked, are, um, are certain spaces more conducive to building the sorts of intersecting spaces that you discussed, Professor Guild? And what are the conditions that allow for the community to flourish? Um, and then relatedly, somebody else asked along the same lines, could you talk a little bit more about the way that physical environments are critical in creating these pan-African diasporic spaces? What, what sorts of features are especially important in that? Does it have to do with the institutions, the size of the population, et cetera? Those are two excellent questions and thank you for, for bringing them together. Uh, yes, uh, space is, is, is critically important to the processes that I'm trying to describe here. Um, both in turn, I mean, I, I write a lot about a West Indian carnival, which I've talked about already. Um, and part of, part of that discussion, part of that analysis is really thinking about how carnival comes to occupy space in Brooklyn, a changing Brooklyn over the course of the 1960s, 70s, and up to, to the present day, and going through neighborhoods that are themselves going through demographic change, particularly after 1965. Um, and, but to just go back to the earlier period, um, uh, the, the, the initiation of carnival in Harlem uh, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, 
Um, there's abundant uh, examples in the archive, particularly in the African American press, of uh, local uh, local Harlemites, uh, African American Harlemites, uh, not really being too sure about what this carnival thing was all about, and not you know being at, uh, either skeptical or or sometimes even hostile to this. Uh, and then part of that was about the way that carnival was occupying space in a city that was in, in an area of the city that was understood at that point as being African American, principally African American, even though of course there had been a longstanding uh, Caribbean population there for for some time. Um, but to 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 go to Brooklyn, um, so part of the spatialization too is the way that um, that that the procession of carnival, right, which is meant to be mobile. Uh, these these decorated floats moving on on trucks through the through the city uh, through through the neighborhood um, is coming in tension with the other carnival arts um, and in particular uh, this this emerging Jamaican music which I which I referred to earlier um, that is really more organized around these sort of static in play sound systems groups of crowds so that there's a there's a carnival that's moving and there's a carnival that are that is fixed in and those two things uh, create some sense of, of tension or at least a, something of dissonance. And there's also the way that uh, some of the other carnival arts, particularly um, steel pan, right, music, uh, eventually gets relegated to its own place because it's completely drowned out by the amplified music uh, that comes to dominate carnival. And so the, so the steel pan uh, competition gets set up near on the grounds of the uh, Brooklyn Museum. Um, so again, a different space separate from some of these other spaces. Um, so space is really important, but there's also the, the kind of intentional spaces that are created, the, the institutions that one of the questioners uh, referenced. And I, I think about uh, the Pan-African and Cultural Nationalist organization called the East, uh, which, which flourished in central Brooklyn in the 1970s. Um, and it was deliberately created as a space to promote uh, uh, diasporic black culture. Um, they put on a, a weekly musical showcase called the Black Experience and Sound, uh, which mainly featured sort of avant-garde jazz musicians, um, but also included Caribbean uh, musicians and included uh, some African musicians playing playing different in different traditions. Randy Weston was very uh, a regular a featured artist there, uh, as well as many other um, Pharrell Sanders, many others of the kind of uh, cutting edge of jazz as avant-garde, so there, was, there, there were spaces that were cultivated intentionally um, to bring together different, uh, different cultures within um, Brooklyn's Black diaspora. Thank you. That's so fascinating. Um, relatedly for um, Professor Mirabal, a couple of questions intersected as well about how these connections were forged between the U.S. and Cuba and how they intersected. Uh, one question asked um, that you you talked about publishing as an important way to create connections between different diasporic communities. And so the audience member asked, could you discuss other ways that these connections developed? Um, this person was thinking of marriage or shared work experiences, things like that. Um, yes, so you know, much of the paper is looking at the the nineteenth century and kind of the the questions around how a um, how a hemisphere, how blackness gets developed and discussed, especially in the possibility of post emancipation. And so that becomes a really important question in the rethinking, not of only a freedom, but what is the future of different uh, Afro-diasporic communities in the hemisphere? And so those connections are actually very intimate and deep, and they create important friendships. So we know that um, one of the ways that they connected, and Josiana Arroyo wrote a brilliant book on this, was really at, through masonry. Um, so many of them were Masons. And so, uh, so for instance, um, Jose Martí, Henry Helen Garnett knew each other through Masonry. Um, Sam, I think Samuel Scotteran knew uh, Booker T. Washington as, through um, Masonry and Rafael Serra was also a Mason. So there were these uh, different clubs, there are also different terms in um, labor. It's, um, it's a fascinating history in that Martin, Martin Moro Delgado is working in the cigar industry in New York that gets displaced from Cuba to New York. 
And that's also another understudied history. It's one of the larger cigar factories that take place in the 19th century. And through work, you do see uh, uh, Afro-Cubans and you see African-Americans coming together through work, through labor organizing. There are friendships. There are, I'm not sure much of intermarriage, but we do know that they begin to live in very close quarters. And what's interesting is that um, Afro-Cubans and white Cubans are really dealing with a lot of racism among the Cuban community. And so there's tension between uh, Cubans around uh, whiteness, around blackness, around power. And so on some level, Afro-Cubans are trying to create this very tenuous relationship with white Cubans because they're fighting for independence, but also understanding that they're being excluded from very important spaces of organizing and politics, which is why they begin to organize among themselves. They create something called La Liga de la Instrucción de Recreo, which got started in 1891, which is primarily just for Black, Cuban, and Puerto Ricans in a way that they wanted to create a space that they didn't have to deal with the racism um, and the whiteness and the problems with white Cubans. So they do organize around there and it's a school and they allow African-American youth to come to that school to take those courses and to be part of that intellectual community. So yeah, there were all these different um, avenues and that's an excellent question, but we have 15 minutes so we really couldn't go <laughs> into all of them, but thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned before that I feel like there's a real convergence of themes in your three papers, even though um, each is quite distinctive in its own way. Here's a question for the entire panel that I think brings some of these convergences together. Somebody asked, do you all describe the Pan-African community at different times in the last 100 or 200 years. Could you speak a little bit about periodization? Were the experiences and interactions between American-born Blacks and diasporic immigrants similar throughout the, let's say, mid-19th to early 21st century? Um, or were there important differences at certain points? So. I mean, I think that's a good question for the entire conference. It's a big question I'm throwing your way. Um, but, you know, I think it's interesting to think about periodization, both in terms of relations between immigrants and native born African Americans, but also periodization just in terms of the diaspora itself. And the, I thought Professor Guild framed the diaspora so nicely. I, I don't think I have the words as eloquent as, as you had it, Professor Guild, but you began by saying that diaspora is both a side of radical possibility, but also a side of tension and struggles. So can we think in terms of periodization on all that? Anyone can take that who would like. This is one of those questions where I'm glad I'm the moderator and I get to ask the question <laughs> and not try to answer it. Well, I'll begin just a little bit narrowly just to, to, to return to, to my project because, I, because for me, um, obviously 1965 is this, is this watershed moment. It was a real you know, singular, uh, singular um, uh, transformative moment. Uh, and so what the, the kind of the, some of the examples that I gave at the outset uh, in terms of um, the Brooklyn, the central Brooklyn of the, of the 1930s or early 1940s um, is reflective of a much smaller West Indian population or, or Afro-Caribbean population, uh, but it's also a, a much smaller African-American population, right? So this is, this is a time when uh, New York City and Brooklyn in particular um, is still undergo still in the in the throes of the Great Migration, and so these Black Southerners are arriving to New York. So there's a certain sense of of, of a kind of shared experience of being newcomers to the city. Of course, it's long, you know, centuries long uh, standing uh, Black communities uh, have been there, but uh, but many of much of what I was describing, much of what I've been, been researching, is, is looking at these these. Uh, newly arrived black Southerners alongside newly arrived folks from uh, Jamaica, or at that time, uh, principally Barbados and Trinidad and, and later Jamaica and some of the other islands. So I think that's important. Um, and that as the communities grow, 
um, and certainly for central Brooklyn, becomes a majority black community, uh, numbering in the hundreds of thousands by mid-century. Uh, so it's you know, almost its own black city, if we sort of took it outside of the context of, of New York. Um, that certainly changes the demographics and some of the experience. But particularly after 1965, uh, when the Caribbean population explodes uh, in New York City and in, in other parts of the country, um, there's a, a, a kind of shift towards a new kind of ethnic politics, I think. Um, and certainly the literature suggests that. Um, and so I think there is a difference as in terms of demographics uh, over time. And then, of course, you have the generational dynamics uh, that others have already talked about. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. That gives us some really useful mileposts. Would anyone else like to speak to that question? And I'll speak briefly to it. I know with the, you know, African immigrant population, we've often, you know, 1980s is really, um, again, that watershed moment for that community, for the African immigrant community, where you start seeing the numbers really increase. So I think when you look at the African immigrants who were coming to the States in, you know, the late 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, um, you did see a higher rate of return. And so there was this sense of euphoria because African countries had gotten their independence from colonialism and they were in, in real need of skilled workforce, you know, doctors and lawyers and economists and so forth. And so you saw a higher rate of return. You did see, though, you know, and there is I don't I don't know. I can't remember any studies specifically, but there have been scholars who have looked at the role of African immigrants in the civil rights movement, because a lot of them did go to HBCUs. A lot of them uh, were in around, and a lot of them did participate. You know, especially when you look at the fact that many of them were also involved in independence movements at home. So, you know, they're coming here in the mid 60s, late 60s, and also getting involved in some of the activities here. However, there were many who didn't because of the fear of, um, you know, their, their status. Their status was a lot more precarious than those who were American citizens, and that's something that's true to today. But when you look at historically black colleges and universities, Pretty much, I would say, I would even, you know, wouldn't go too far on a limb to say that most of them have African faculty who are at those institutions, many of whom have been at those institutions for, you know, definitely since the 90s is when I think I really am in, in looking at the presence of African faculty at HBCUs. Uh, a lot of them are in business, the business school, a lot of them are in economics departments, uh, but there has for a while been a, a presence of African faculty and scholars at HBCUs. Even the smallest HBCU in, in somewhere in the middle of Alabama, you'll find the, the economics department has a couple African professors on uh, faculty there. So it's been a, it's a, a very interesting thing to look at. I guess the only thing that I would add to those like um, resp incredible responses is that the question reminded me of Earl Lewis's concepts of overlapping diaspora and the diversity of Black life. And that the, as he says in the seminal article, that the definitions of Blackness are always changing. Um, they're, con they're continually changing depending on the period, history, generation, migrations. And added to that, um, as Dr. Gill mentioned, 1965 is a watershed moment. We see a major increase in migrants coming from the Dominican Republic, for instance, um, that begin to um, complicate uh, ideas around immigration, blackness, um, language, um, all of these connections, networks. And so oftentimes in doing this research and in writing my book and articles and so forth, I think that uh, the idea of Pan-Africanism has always been a really beautiful idea. Uh, it's one that keeps, um, it, it's almost like an imagining that is necessary to push forward. But when it came to practical realities, really does run into tensions and problems and, um, you know, uh, and conflicts. So it, it's something, it's, it just seems to be like an ongoing question um, during time, um, historically in the United States. Thank you for that. Um, 
Yeah, it seems like to really answer the question, there would be so many things we'd have to think about um, that the experiences of black immigrants change over time. The nature of the diaspora itself changes, but um, the, the structures of racism or xenophobia that they confront also change over time. Um, and then at the same time, the African-American population itself is changing over time. And so any effort to periodize across the 19th and 20th centuries to the present day would have to be thinking at, of the ways in which all of those different dynamics are, are changing. Um, my advisor, when I was in graduate school, David Montgomery used to like to say that history is a moving target. <laughs> And, uh, and so it's hard to take aim because so much is moving all at once. Um, there were actually, there were a few other questions about this issue of Pan-African identity. Um, one that I thought was really interesting, if we can think uh, in, the, in a future way a little bit, um, Dave E in the audience said, what would it look like to realize the ideals of Pan-Africanism. Um, is there, uh, this kind of gets back to diaspora and its radical possibility, I guess. Davy asked, do you think global blacks are ready to uni unify across cultural differences? I mean, so it's a it's a huge question that's that's I think um, you're really really challenging to take on. But let me just say one thing is that I think one one impediment to to any kind of unity across uh, across the diaspora is nationalism, right? It's that, that there will be no sense of, uh, of of that radical possibility if we are if we are remain attached to uh, and beholden to na the nation state into into nationalisms uh, of other sorts, and so. You know, I think that that time and time again, certainly in the 20th century, and we see now in the 21st century, um, any kind of efforts to kind of reach beyond, uh, reach across borders, uh, runs into both uh, the nation state as as something that um, is is exclusionary uh, uh, and, and keeping people out. So our our immigration regimes in, in various uh, parts of the world, um, but also a kind of a, a attachment and affiliation that people want to hold on to, um, and that also to these policing uh, other other you know, black people in other parts of the world, and so I think that 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 nationally we really need to try to attend to and think about think critically about uh, the nation state and nationalism as the as these kinds of uh, real obstacles um, to to realizing any type of Pan African idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. That makes me think again about. Um, Professor Davies using the Frederick Douglass quote, living in the country and living in the world and dual identity and, and your comments, um, Professor Guild remind us that there can be a real struggle between those different identities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything else on any of the, anyone else wanted to comment on that question or shall we toss out another one? We, um, it's, it's so exciting. I know we have an audience of hundreds of people and it's so exciting to see what the audience is thinking about. One thing that came up was that all of your talks um, kind of centered around New York City and that makes a lot of sense, but um, as someone in the audience wonders if there are other, <coughs> excuse me, other cities or other sites in the U.S. that um, would change our thinking about these relationships or reinforce what we are seeing in New York City. I wonder if any one of you would uh, want to respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can just, in, in terms of the um, the from the African immigrant perspective, I mean, New York is definitely a huge 
city, but uh, you also have Washington D.C., where which is the area I'm in, and I think uh, Washington D.C. and New York have kind of gone back and forth as to which one has the largest African immigrant population. I know, for example, in D.C., there's a definitely a large Ethiopian population, so you see more. Um, the translating of more documents and, and kind of signs and, and like the public transportation will have something in Amharic. And uh, so you'll see that in, in terms of accommodating the Ethiopian community here in Washington. And then Ethiopian restaurants, far out number of restaurants from other communities. Uh, so you see that, I mean, in other places, Minneapolis has a large Somali community. And so in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, you see a lot of grocery stores and restaurants and mosques that are servicing the Somali community. So Houston also is a, is a big area uh, where you'll find a lot of African immigrants, Los Angeles. So I think there are these places. And then there are some places that are somewhat surprising, like Columbus, Ohio has a fairly large African immigrant population. And the immigrant population, um, you know, they they have their own grocery stores, their own kind of institutions and organizations there. But uh, yeah, so you'll find these things, these pockets uh, where you'll find primarily one group, but then you'll find other pockets where you'll just kind of have a diverse collection of immigrants from different parts of the continent. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure that as we focus on the post-1965 period in particular, the, the number of sites where the, this kind of research needs to happen expand. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Atlanta, Miami, yeah. in addition to the cities you mentioned would all be really exciting to look at in greater depth. Let's see, again, with the um, you know, the uh, audience is really picking up on these issues of Pan-Africanism. There's a question for the whole panel from Ron Brown um, saying, with the advent of DNA connecting us to our roots, can we see a resurgence of Pan-Africanism? And what should we expect from that? Would, would, might that change the global history of Pan-Africanism? Well, I will say I know that there have been, well, there have been several people who've done the DNA test to find out which part of Africa their ancestry is from. Uh, there have been a couple of high profile cases of people who have actually gotten dual citizenship based on their DNA test. Uh, there's the actor, and I cannot remember his name right now, um, but he, uh, his, his DNA test showed that he had Mende ancestry from Sierra Leone and he was able to get a Sierra Leonean passport based off of his DNA results. And there have been a couple of others that have also been able to do so. I mean, I think some of that is, you know, of course, because of who he is, the government of Sierra Leone, I think, you know, kind of decided that they wanted to bestow on him citizenship, but uh, you do see it also kind of influencing people's maybe decision to go back home, well, to go go back, go to Africa and which part of Africa they may visit may be influenced by the results of their DNA test. So I've seen some of that uh, increasing people's connections or wanting to connect more with the continent based on their results. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a very much an open question. Um, you know, I think there's a there's a, a what we might think of as a kind of false certainty around some of the some of that uh, information, some of those results, right? And that people uh, who who receive those results um, don't always uh, receive them and study them critically. And there, I think there there's a because of that deep longing for connection. There's a there's a desire to 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 point to a place on a map and to be able to visit that place and potentially even to to move there. Um, and it's it's obviously quite complicated. Uh, just just that the, the steps in that process, and then the actual encounter that might happen uh, in you know whether it's in, in in Ghana or Sierra Leone or Angola or, or wherever. Um, from thinking about um, diasporic Africans, whether whether um, from uh, the United States or from other parts of uh, of the diaspora, um, traveling to the continent. 
Um, and I think we can also point back to a kind of longer history of African American, uh, a Black American movement, circulation, and, and particularly settlement in Africa, going back to uh, 19th century Black missionaries. Um, this is sort of a really deep and complicated uh, question into power, hier power hierarchies um, that come into play in that context. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Here's a, again with the Pan-Africanism, but this is a question specifically for Professor Mirabal. Um, how, let's see, I just lost it. The chat moved on me. How does, this is interesting. How does Pan-Africanism inform Pan-Americanism? This comes from uh, Diane Puentes Martinez in the audience. Okay, so I'm not too familiar with Pan Americanism, so I'm going to assume that it's kind of, um, and, and she can correct me if it's wrong on the chat, but uh, a kind of a move around really challenging artificial borders and ideas of territoriality among the different um, countries and this idea of what does it mean to be from the Americas. And so I think that, I, I, you know, I think again, everybody has said, I mean, the response to Pan-Africanism has been excellent, which is this idea that it's complicated, that it's um, defined by periodization, defined by certain desires at certain moments. What Pan-Africanism meant in the mid to late 19th century is very different than what it means in the 30s. Um, so, for instance, Pan-Africanism in the 1930s, a lot of it is um, defined and by communism and the rise of communism and socialism as a panacea for uh, communities of color. I mean, that happens in New York with the, the rise of the IWO and their ability to recruit both African-Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Cuban migrants uh, into labor organizing. So, and part of that was to use this kind of uh, Pan-American, Pan-African ideal of creating connections uh, within different nations and countries. So it is specific to a time place. I think that also happened, we could argue, through the Third World Liberation Movement, so the 1960s and 70s, where there was this need to kind of um, find connection, whether it was through the borderlands and the Chicano movement or the Young Lords and Borinquen with Puerto Ricans and African Americans and so forth. There's always been this need to connect um, so, and, and find uh, a common space for alliance and building, and that makes sense because that's a very empowering position to be at. Um, but where you get into, again, some kind of conflict is really, I think, fundamentally is translating the imagining, the power of the imagining, the power of the desire, and concrete practical um, measures and how that looks like. So that's always seems to be historically the, the biggest issue. So I think that Pan-Africanism and Pan-Americanism, if I understand uh, her definition around Pan-Americanism, what they have in common is this desire to create community out of um, an imagining of space and time and, and people that think alike or have similar uh, desires. Um, but at the same time, realizing that um, there are these points of contention and conflicts that, um, in the end, make it very difficult for um, communities based on whether it's location, territories, or race to come together. I don't know if anyone Thank else you. wants to <laughs> add to that, but, you know. Thank you. You're all doing such a great job with tough questions. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I think I swallowed a little bug. So my voice is having some struggles. Um, let's see, uh, this was an interesting question. Capitalism has come up a little bit in this conversation, but I'm sure there's a lot more that we could do with it. There's a question from Jasmine in the audience. Um, saying that a Twitter influencer described Beyonce's Black is King as, quote, an African aesthetic drift in capitalism. Can, and so Jasmine wonders, can African Americans appropriate African cultures 
or vice versa? Or are these people really part of a larger global capitalistic culture? Hmm. So there, there have been quite a few criticisms of Beyonce's Black is King. And I think that that is, you know, one of the, the big ones. And I think that the Beyonce's, the Black is King budget, it was, you know, I don't know I don't know the numbers, but I'm assuming it was rather large. It is not the first time an African-American artist has incorporated African music and symbolism and culture into their video projects. It's just probably one of the ones that's had the biggest budget. There have been since Africans were taken from the continent and, and you know, kind of spread throughout the diaspora, there have been back and forth culturally, musically, fashion-wise, where groups have borrowed from each other. So when you look at Fela's Afrobeat, it's heavily influenced by the funk music scene in Los Angeles. He was in Los Angeles. He was around, you know, um, during the time of some of the Black nationalist movements there. And that influences ideology as well. Kwame Nkrumah, the Ghanaian flag is largely influenced by Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line. Um, so you've you've got, you've always had, since Black people were dispersed, you know, people borrowing from each other. South Africa's jazz scene is very much connected to the jazz scene in America. So I I wouldn't say it in that it, in a bad way. So when you get into the kind of capital the capitalist machine that runs the music industry, I mean, there are a lot of problems there that are beyond just, you know, black music or, you know, hip hop or what have you. I think universally the music industry tends to not value creativity and innovation. They rather, you know, follow a specific formula for success. So, you know, there are also African artists who are, you know, uh, Burna Boy is an artist that's making a lot of money. Um, capitalizing off of African music. So I think that you, there is, I think we have to, we have to, to be critical and we have to kind of hold artists accountable. Um, but I don't think that it's a, I don't, I'm someone who doesn't believe that African Americans can appropriate African culture in a negative way. I think we appropriate each other's culture. We've always done that and we will always continue to do that. So it was like, we're borrowing from a, a pot that we've all kind of contributed to and influenced. Um, so I don't see that as being something negative. I just see that as being something natural. Thank you. <clears throat> Professors Mirabal or Guild, is, do you have any thoughts on the larger question of how capitalism shapes your approach to your work? Well, I mean, insofar as capitalism, you know, helps to shape and is the context in which, um, you know, white supremacy is, it gets expressed uh, both, uh, both in this country and, uh, and globally, um, it's always going to be a consideration. I mean, I think there are, there are deep labor questions involved here in terms of if we're thinking about immigration, histories of immigration to this country. Um, we're thinking about conflicts, uh, ethnic conflicts uh, within Black communities or between Black communities in this country. We have to we have to you know take that also into consideration, um, and to and to sort of connect uh, with Professor Clark's response uh, in thinking about um, you know how we have to we have to consider how Black Americans are positioned globally now, um, you know, in the marketplace, right, in the marketplace of culture. Um, and and this has been a, not just this is not just a contemporary issue. This is this is a, a, a kind of long-standing historical issue of the, ex, the kind of export of Black American culture globally, uh, whether to the continent to the Caribbean. Um, that certainly was part of the part of the um, the, the ingredients that helped to produce uh, reggae music uh, and of Jamaican popular music. In other words, um, you know, American radio beaming from, from Nashville, from New Orleans, from Miami, you know, and other places making it to, to, to Jamaica um, helped to, 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 to inspire and, and, and produce new forms of innovation, new forms of culture. Um, but there's also uh, fears, and I think justified fears in, in, in many places of, uh, of Black American culture um, in some ways sort of stamping out or overwhelming 
uh, indigenous black cultures, you know, whether whether in the UK or in France or Brazil or other places. And so there, there are tensions if we look sort of outside of North America to how black American culture circulates. And, 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 and in that conversation, and we have to think about the way that capital um, um, helps to kind of undergird those processes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank um, you. Uh, just Yes, absolutely. I think capitalism is central to any kind of analysis that has to deal with race or ethnicity or immigration. They're all tied up. Um, it's fundamental into our understanding of racial capitalism. I think when we think about slavery, when we think about expansionism, annex annexationism, the role of uh, immigrants and uh, labor systems that continually put um, immigrants as certain kinds of workers over others, uh, you, you're, you're really, in many ways, talking about capitalism and talking about the impact and effects of capitalism on immigrant communities and also on communities um, from, from the diaspora. So, um, yeah, they're all absolutely connected. And I think in many ways, um, my work oftentimes is a commentary on capitalism and um, the problems of capitalism. Thank you. I think this was a fantastic first session for our conference. Three truly brilliant presentations. Thank you all so much. And thank you um, <clears throat> also just for being so game to take a lot of very different questions. Um, so thank you all. You got us off to a great and robust start tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Really fantastic. I want to um, tell our audience, remember that session two on transnational ties and conceptions of home will begin tomorrow, Saturday at 4.30 <clears throat> Eastern time. And it will be another great session with uh, Namata Blyden, Violet Showers Johnson, and Paul Joseph Lopez Oro speaking. Um, remember, too, that there will be nine more sessions over the next three weeks, and you can check the full schedule at the link in the chat. So do please all come back and join us for more um, fabulous presentations and a, and a thought-provoking conversation as well. Thank you all again so much. I applaud you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and good night to everybody. <laughs>